Thank you guys for being here tonight. Tonight's message is going to be called Transform Your Mind. Everybody say, Transform Your Mind. The state of a person's mind is uh, referred to very often by this term, mental health. A very common term um, that we use. Now, current events in America, I'm sure you guys are aware, um, or at least what's been dominating our news cycle has been a series of shootings that they're calling mass shootings, right? Um, there, Uvalde, Buffalo, Tulsa, um, and then recently, I guess, there was one in Philadelphia. And um, so these things have been uh, dominating our news cycle, been happening uh, basically what looks like or what's created to look like all across the United States. And mental health is something that people are bringing up as a problem in our country. Now, I believe the answer for that is found in Christ. Amen? That we have the answer, um, the only place that people can find what they need, the peace they need, is in Jesus. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let's pray. God, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for everyone who's here, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit is with us tonight. Help me speak your words and not my own, God. And we're just thankful to be able to be here and learn from your word tonight. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. So about a week after the Uvalde tragedy, Dr. Deegan, um, he's Duncan's school superintendent, um, he put out an article um, in the local newspapers. He writes routine articles in the newspapers. And he put out an article called, uh, Schools Cannot Help all the mental health needs. And he wrote a whole entire article about the issues that, that schools deal with. Um, if you've ever met Dr. Deegan, he's a great man. He's a follower of Christ. He actually has met with the youth pastors. He's brought the youth pastors in, and uh, he's encouraged us to be in the schools. And he's been a great, you know, open door. He's been a good guy. He's viewing this through a Christian perspective, saying that mental health can't be helped by the schools. And um, you guys know my wife, April, is a doctor. Many of you know she's a clin uh, doctor for a clinic in Comanche. And, uh, of course, she doesn't tell me anything about who anybody is or any specific people as reference. But just the other day, she told me. So my wife, of course, doctor in Comanche, just the other day, she said, mental health issues just over the last month, last month have just skyrocketed, that she's had so many people... Um, that have had a problem with mental health that she's done a lot more counseling sometimes than medical care. Um, so mental health, according to both education and our medical professionals, um, they agree that it's on the rise, that there's, that there's a struggle with mental health. Now, before we go any farther in this, I want us to find something and a foundation that we can agree on, um, because this is a topic we need to have a common ground here. So there are such things as true medical mental health issues. I think everybody can agree on that, that there are mental health issues that are medical, that can be treated with medicine, and should be and need to be treated with medicine. Amen? Amen. Now, there are also, without a doubt, certain aspects of what our society calls mental health and what medicine might call mental health that would not be a medical issue. Um, the reason for that is because we as humans, we're not just a physical being that can be affected by just medicine. We as humans have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And all three of those things need to be working in order for us to function correctly. Amen? Not just our medical needs. And so there are things that at their root are spiritual issues. Now, many people would rather just uh, sweep them under a rug and acknowledge them as a health issue because that means you don't have to acknowledge there's a spiritual aspect to a problem. Of course, like I said, there are medical mental health issues. Would that mean that you shouldn't do all you can, talk to counselors, use medicine, and use what is at your disposal? Um, absolutely, uh, you should use all those things. You, you should use all the things that are at your disposal to help you. Um, this is not a message that's out like, you know, just Jesus and that's it. That's not what this is. But we have to acknowledge, we have to find common ground that there is a certain aspect of what happens in our mind and in our spirit that only Christ can solve. Amen? Now, the only solution for humanity is coming to Christ. That's a common ground I think we believe, that coming to Jesus is our only solution. And you and I are the church. And you guys are here on a Sunday night in June, um, 
and you're not fishing, you're not napping, you're not working, you're not doing chores because you believe in the power of the church. You believe that there's a value to being here on, on a Sunday night and learning about the power of God. So Jesus, everybody said Jesus. Jesus looked at believers, and every, ever since I read this verse and understood it in the way I have, um, it's been something that has just always stuck with me, and it has a great magnitude in my life. Jesus looked at them in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, and he said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Jesus says that we are salt. Look at your neighbor and say, Stay salty. Stay salty. Not mad, stay salty. Uh, Jesus, on the surface, says that we're salt, but he means something much deeper than that we're just like, we're salt. There's something to this, and when you discover it, 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 if, it if you're like me, you're like, whoa. What does salt do? Salt has some qualities. Salt seasons things. Salt makes things that are not so good taste good. Salt makes things savory. So we as Christians on the earth make the earth savory in the eyes of God and we cause the earth to be still acceptable to Him. It still tastes good. It still looks good. Everybody tracking with me. Salt also preserves things. If you salt something, it will last a long time. Salt preserves Food, salt preserves different things. Salt keeps things clean. The ocean is not nasty because it's salty, right? I mean, it's still kind of nasty, but it's not as nasty as Warwick Lake, right? And so it's because of the salt content. We as believers in Christ remain on earth, and we preserve the world. We resist moral decay, we resist corruption, and we preserve godly influence. And because we are still here on earth, we spread the one message of truth that can save the rest of humanity. We're the one thing left, the one agent of change left on the planet that can create change in the earth because we are the salt of the earth. We have the gospel. So tonight, everybody say tonight. Just now getting to the points here, but they're going to move quickly. How can we as Christians preserve our own mental health? How can we have a sound mental health for ourselves when there's a lot of things happening around us where that, that are chaotic, that cause us to be distracted, that cause us to be panicked, worried, all these things. How do we preserve a sound mind and have mental health? Number one. Number one is know who you are. So I have a daughter. Um, her, she's three. Her name is Blaze. And Blaze, right now, because she's three, is absolutely into princess movies. Like, we have watched Frozen a million... Like, I, like, guys, I've watched Frozen so many times that I'm, like, a Frozen expert, and I've figured out all the themes. And just so you know, if you ever watch Frozen, the main problem is bad parenting, right? Just so you know. You're, like, bad parenting. Like, her parent... You don't shut your kids out from each other. Just getting way sidetracked here. If y'all haven't seen Frozen, you have no idea. Bad parenting in that movie. I've seen Tangled, Princess, Minnie Mouse a million times. We're watching princess movies. And uh, she loves to dress up like a princess. That's been her thing, wearing a little dress. And today when I got home for a little while for lunch, she said, let's go outside in the front yard. We go outside in the front yard. She goes out and she sings, does a twirl, runs around. And then she was like, you scare off the bad guys. And so I picked up a stick, fought off the bad guys, and saved the princess. Yeah, it was great. And so um, the other day we're doing something similar in the front yard. And the cat, our cat, is in the, like, the ornamental grass kind of in the front. He's in there, and she found a stick, and she's kind of like poking at him, and uh, she thinks it's fun. She's laughing. He's kind of reacting. She thinks it's fun poking at him, kind of poking him in the face. And, uh, and he kind of swats at her, doesn't claw her, just swats at her, and, but it scares her, kind of upsets her, and she runs over to me. And she goes, Daddy! And I'm like, what happened? And she's like, Carbon, the cat, the cat's name's Carbon. Carbon scratched me. And she goes, He scratched the princess! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> we better watch out, that'll get you killed if you scratch the princess. Uh, she said, he scratched the princess, so we've played all these things. Now, one more thing, I've got a picture on the screen. Um, we go out in the yard, I'm working, and I turn around and she's laying there like that, and I'm like, what's going on? Well, it's exactly recreating that scene from the movie that's also in the picture. 
like just trying to be Rapunzel, like being incredibly cute and being a princess, right? So why am I saying that? Because Blaze, at three years old, uh, for this time, playing for 10, has decided she's a princess, right? Like her identity is princess. Um, in our culture, we have a huge identity problem. Many people don't know who they are, what they are supposed to do, where they came from. We have an identity issue. Now, if you don't know the truth about yourself, you will believe a lie about yourself. Then you take that lie, and it will warp you into something you're not, because you don't know what the truth is. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you're supposed to be. So if you don't believe the truth about yourself, you will believe a lie about yourself. Now, the Bible has the truth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That clears up quite a bit because it will give you some truth about you. You were created by God. It will also give you some truth that says you were created male and female on purpose, for a purpose, right? It, it, that clears some things up that culture doesn't have straight. You were created male and female. Um, now you couple that with this verse, Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. When you take those verses together, it's pretty clear who you are. You're created by God the way you were supposed to be created. You were created by God, and He knew you. He, God knows you. Even if you don't currently know God, God does know you. And every life has been also, not only were you created by God and He knows you, He created you with a purpose. He has something for you to do. If it was true for Jeremiah, it's true for you. He has something for you to do. Every life has value and purpose according to the will of God. We clear up a lot if we know that God's created us, that God's given a purpose, that God knows us, and we realize that God loves us. Number two, everybody say number two. The second thing we can do is be able to identify truth. We live in a time where there are 10,000 opinions about everything. The dress is blue. No, it's gold. Johnny Depp is guilty. No, he's not guilty. Right? Like, you know, y'all don't pretend like y'all didn't pay attention. It was weird, but it happened. Right? All that stuff's weird, but people paid attention. Johnny Depp's guilty. No, he's not. Right? Opinions everywhere, despite the facts. Um, people will say, well, we have this kind of problem. No, we have, that's our problem. We have an opinion about everything. Despite what the facts and the truth are, there's an opinion out there for everything that people believe and defend as a truth. And honestly, that's exhausting. It's exhausting to try to decipher the truth from the chaos and the lies and the mayhem. It's crazy. It's exhausting. Like, it, the reality that the, the problem we're in is because people don't have the time to, to properly research anything, so they just jump to the first thing they like, and then here we are, right? But it's exhausting because there's so much lies and so much info. That grates on our mental health if, if we don't have some sort of truth and, and guide and moral compass. It, it will destroy your mental health if you have no compass, guide, and a way to get yourself back to a proper state. We have a compass, amen? Our compass is the Word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7 says this, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The verse says the words of the Lord, the words in Scripture, revive our soul. That it helps us, it revives us, it brings back life to us that we did not have. And they revive us because they set us back in truth. They, they, they put us back in the right light. They put us back where we need to be. If we ever were to, to go and think that something else might be true, that if we read the Bible and it sets us, we read the Bible and we take its words and they sink in, it sets us back on the foundation of truth that we need to be on. And we do not get out lost and we don't go out and create a whole other truth and get our mental health shattered. So I want you guys to catch this. I tell this to students all the time in youth. It is almost a mantra of mine. And I've said it many times on Sunday nights too. Everything we do, everything we think, everything we believe, everything we understand 
has to be looked at through Scripture as a whole and viewed through that prism. Like, you've got to see things through Scripture. Like, everything we do must be looked at through Scripture. And, and we understand that, but it means that everything that we see, we have to realize, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about where we're at now? What does the Bible say about me, despite my surroundings? Everything's through Scripture. And it gives us clarity. It weeds out fear, and it weeds out panic, and it helps us identify truth. Number three. Number three is build your life on Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27 says this, Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and the torrents and floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When it rains and floods come and the wind beats against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So how many of you guys in here, raise your hands just for a moment, have ever built a sandcastle? Most of us, right? Most of us have built a sandcastle. When you build a sandcastle, um, you can build it, you can put all the effort you want into it, you can build a giant, extravagant, really cool sandcastle, you can build a small one, doesn't matter. It will not last. It will not make it for very many hours or days. And the reason is, is because it's not built out of the right thing. It's not built with the right, it's not built out of the right materials. And it's not usually built in the right place. It's usually built on the beach, and you build it right by the water, and then in two hours, the tide comes up and it's gone, Right? And then if you, even if you were lucky enough for it to survive for a while, once it rains, it's gone, right? Or once some mean kid comes down the beach, he's going to kick it down, right? I was that mean kid. I was like the kid, like, I, I, you know, I was like, nobody else built sandcastles better than me. That was me. Like, this is a side story, but you guys will enjoy it. When I was a kid, I lived over in Meridian Heights, I grew up over there, had some kids that were my age. We ran around, rode bikes. We were like, you know, we thought we were really cool and tough. And we go off into this, like, new area that's like, somebody, you know, is your adult. You're like, that's somebody's property? We go off in this new area, and we see this little, like, really kind of rickety built, like, fort. But it's built out of branches, and it's not, you know, it's not like we, you know, somebody actually put nails and stuff. But we thought, how dare somebody build a fort on our cool, they, this is our territory, neighborhood kids. So what did we do? We like kicked that fort down. That was a bunch, that's not good, right? That, that's what happens to your forts or your sandcastles. Not like fort, you know, don't build it. It's not built to last, right? We know that sandcastles, things like that, not built to last. Um, Jesus knew that. He knew what he was saying. Jesus said that because life can be shifty. People are shifty. People are always shifting, always changing. Uh, culture is shifty. Gas prices are shifty. Not really, they're just constantly going up, but they're shifty, right? Um, the things around us are shifty. Our sports teams are shifty. Like the Thunder used to be good, and now they're not good. They don't even try to be good. Like things are shifty. Even my own talent, my own ability, and even kind of my reliability toward myself can be shifty, right? I don't always come through for me. Everybody tracking with me here. Like, I can be shifty for me. Jesus knew that. But he also knew this. He knows he is not shifty. That he's solid. That he will always be there. That he is the foundation we need. That he is what we can build on. That he will always be there. And he's the one person, the one uh, thing in our lives that will come through on his promises. And Jesus says some promises for us. He says he's coming back. That is reassuring if you know Jesus. That's terrifying if you don't know Jesus. But it's very reassuring for those of us who do. And he also promised us another thing. He promised us his Holy Spirit. Jesus promised us that he was going to leave. He would come back. But he said, I'm not leaving you alone. You will have the Holy Spirit. You'll have the Comforter. You'll have the Advocate. And guys, we must have the Holy Spirit. Like, I just something I believe for me 
and I know for me is is I just know that it's for, the truth for me is that I wouldn't be able to be up here without the Holy Spirit. Like if you would have told me when I was in junior high or high school that this is what I would do, I'd be like, no way, y'all crazies. Like I'm not speaking in front of anybody. That is dumb. I'm not doing that. Like I wasn't going to do it. Like. And I still, you know, honestly, I'm like, is it the Holy Spirit that I come up here because it's not like, y'all are nerv- y'all make me nervous and, and kind of intimidating and like, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's what I do. I'm getting more used to it. All those things, right? Amen. The Holy Spirit helps us. Um, I also, I believe this. I'm sure many of you will agree with me. I, I truly don't know if you can have sound mental health in 2022 without the Holy Spirit helping you. Like, even if you know of Jesus, without the Holy Spirit helping you be able to make it day to day, I do not know if you can have mental health. Because the Holy Spirit is what gives us peace. The Holy Spirit's what gives us the ability to make it through our day to day. Without the Holy Spirit, I just don't know if, if anybody would be able to do it under their own efforts, under their own truths, under their own abilities. We need the Holy Spirit. And praise God, the Holy Spirit is available to us. Amen? that we have the Holy Spirit as an option because of Jesus Christ. He freely gives it to us. To conclude this message, I have quickly three things that we can do to help other people with their mental health. Because you guys, and myself included, we we help other people uh, throughout their Christian walk. We help other people. We help our kids. We help, um, for me, I help youth students. We help people around us through this life. And how can we help others with their mental health? How can we help them have a sound mental health? The first thing is we reflect Jesus' example. Uh, Matt read this exact same verse this morning, and it's crazy because I didn't ask him his verses, and he didn't ask me mine, but I wrote it up last night, and here we are. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. We desire to be examples of Christ to those around us. So the very first thing we have to do is make sure that people realize that I do not do this under my own efforts. I am able to make it through this because I have Jesus in my life, that Jesus is my source, that Jesus is my purpose. It's not for my own efforts. And we live as an example and a model for Jesus. We aren't perfect like Jesus. We never will be. We have mistakes. But people need to be able to see that our mistakes don't prevent us from having the joy and the peace that we need in this life. That we have mistakes, we have regrets, we have things we wish we would not have done, but they do not hinder us from having the peace that comes from Jesus, that comes from being a follower of Him. People really need to see that. Because so many people are dealing with mistakes, hurts, hang-ups, and problems, and they need to see that we've all done some mistakes, hurts, hang-ups, and problems, but we have God, we have Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, and that's how we've made it through this. That it's not under our own power. We demonstrate that peace to others, and like the verse says, that they will see um, our honorable behavior, I mean, they will see that something is different. And they very well may just give glory to God, or the verse says they will. The second thing we can do is we are trustworthy and we are honest. I think we all understand and agree that Jesus, when he was on earth, would have been trustworthy and honest. He wasn't going to lie. He was going to be dependable. He was going to come through. We, as followers of Christ, must make sure that we are dependable, honorable, and that we come through with what we say. We need to be, some pe- we need to be people who are, uh, unlike the world, we're not shaky. We, we are not sand in somebody's life, right? We are not a uh, sandcastle. We're something that's actually foundational truth, that we'll actually be there, that what we say will happen. And that kind of goes all the way down to the very trivial stuff. What time are you going to be there? 1030. Be there at 1030. It's a reflection of Jesus. Uh, I, I'm like, that's just the way I view things. Like, if, you, if we say we're going to do something, it reflects Christ. We need to be honorable, reliable, faithful people because everything we do as a believer even if we don't realize it basically has the stamp of christ on it because we claim to be jesus we claim to follow jesus right so it has a stamp on it it has the it has the look of somebody who follows christ we need to be trustworthy we need to be honest 
Now, we don't want to be the lady who's like out here ready to tell everybody how it is, right? Like, y'all just need to, and when you hear y'all just need to, you know that they're fixing to say something, right? Like, y'all just need to do this. Like, people will say, like, I've heard, because the youth, you know, like, they'll be like, something will happen, they'll be a little rowdy, and they'll be like, y'all just need to get them all lined out. And I'm like, this is lined out. You guys have no idea. Like, I'm proud of them. Like, we only had three ruckuses. It's not a big deal. Like, this is great. Uh, that, you know, we don't want to be that. But we do want to be honest. We want to be uh, someone who tells the truth. Now, we want to tell it with grace. But we need to tell the truth because we're, uh, if we truly believe that we have the truth, we read the truth, God's Holy Spirit is in us providing us with truth, we have to be kind of confident in the fact that I'm the one person who might actually have the truth for these people. In a way that sounds a little... Like, it doesn't mean you're overconfident. It doesn't mean it's because of you, but it's because of God. You have the ability to guide people in truth. And you have the ability to help people, and you might be the only one who has the truth for them. And you help them fall into their truth. You gracefully model it and guide them to the truth they need. The third thing and the last thing we can do to help others is we can have confidence regarding the future. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three record this story. And when you read the Bible or you study the Bible, whenever three of the four Gospels recorded a story, that doesn't happen that often. And then it, it's even more rare that they all four record something. But all three Gospels recorded this story. Jesus and his disciples are out on a boat, and they're attempting to cross the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible calls, what the Bible calls a furious storm blows in, and the Bible says the storm was so strong the waves are breaking over the boat. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been out of, on a boat when it's really windy, but it's rough. Like, it's really rough. We, when I was a kid, Dad bought this old kind of, you know, old boat. And it had like a 50 horsepower engine on it. And we would take it out on Warica Lake, which only like four days of the year in Oklahoma can a 50 horsepower engine power you across Warica Lake. But we got out there one day, and it was like super windy, and it's like, you know, this little 50-horse engine is giving it every horse it's got, right? And you're like doing the lean, trying to get it over the waves. And we finally get back, of course, but it's rough, right? And these disciples in this story um, have no horsepower engine. They're just rowing, trying to get across. So they're getting beat. The wind's coming over. It's bad. And these are experienced fishermen, sailors, and they're scared. They're freaking out. And uh, the story, the Bible says the, the disciples run to the back of the boat, and they're going to get Jesus because Jesus is not out here. And they go to find him, and he's sleeping. He's sleeping on, in the back. The Bible says on a cushion, like just taking the best nap he's ever had back there in the back of the boat. Um, just so you know this, just a little fact here, a little, little uh, throw in there. It had to have been on a Sunday because the best naps always happen on Sunday. So if anybody ever asked, this was on a Sunday. Yeah, best naps happen on Sundays. Uh, Jesus is sleeping back there. Now, they wake him up and they say, Master, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus, like, because he was taking the best nap of his life, like, kind of, it's like, I, I envision him, like, getting up mad, kind of like, you know, y'all, I'm sleeping. Like, I, there's one rule, and when I nap on Sundays, don't wake me up. Like, anyway, he gets up goes out, and he, he speaks to the waves, says, peace be still, and it goes from being, like, crazy storm like they haven't seen to, like, freaky still, right? Like, the Bible says dead still, which is also really eerie, you know, but eerie in, like, we're going to survive way, and uh, the Bible says the disciples are astonished because Jesus just spoke to this, and the only thing he says to them is, why were you so afraid what, where, why do you still have such a little faith? He's not, uh, he's concerned with their faith. He's concerned with, you were worried about the future, you were worried about what was going to happen to you, and you didn't realize that I was here in the back of the boat? Like, in a way, I don't know, like, what Jesus' optimal scenario was. Like, was his optimal scenario that they just, like, ride the storm out? Like, I don't know. Y'all see what I'm saying here? But he wakes up and he kind of is like, why do you not have faith? Because I'm in the boat. For us, everybody say for us. For us, we have confidence regarding the future 
even though everything around us is chaotic, everything around us is a storm, because we realize we have Jesus in our boat. That we have Jesus with us going through what we're going through. That we don't go at it alone, and we don't go at it without Him involved, and we don't go at it without His guidance and His truth and His Word. Jesus is with us. We've read His Word. We know the end of the book. And we've been given the Holy Spirit as comfort. Uh, We know what truth is. And we haven't placed our faith in anything that's not Christ. We haven't placed our faith in politics or economic uh, theories or policies. We haven't placed our faith in a certain world ruler. We have placed our faith in Jesus, the person who has the ability to keep us safe. Our faith is in Jesus. So closing this out, when the rest of the world is worried, afraid, scared, you know, panicking, what do we do about this mental health in the world? What do we do about these crazy people who do all these things? What do we do about, you know, what, you know, all these people vote for? Like, where do they get these things? We don't panic because we realize that we have Jesus in our boat. We, we don't go about it without, like, we have no voice and we have no control, right? You still have your voice, you still have control, you still have influence, you're still salt, you're not left without power because you are still the one preserving the world. But we realize that the rest of the world might be deceived by a lie, might not be going down, uh, might be going down, um, which we know, according to Scripture, the world eventually goes down. It's not a shock. It's not a shock that things um, deteriorate and get worse. Like, we, if we've read our Bible, we realize that, that things deteriorate, get worse, We're still here up until some point, until Jesus uh, catches us up in the sky, which I wish was tomorrow, but if it's not, we're still here. And we have to realize that we we remain calm, we aren't shaken, because we have Christ. We must be the group of people on the earth that are calm and, and unshaken. That goes back to the point where we reflect Christ. He's not freaking out. He's not afraid. He's calm. He's unshaken. He's not worried. We reflect that back. We can help, uh, we can have sound mental health because we have the Holy Spirit. We can guide others to peace that they need because they're desperately searching for Christ even if they don't realize it. The world desperately needs Christ. Uh, You know, it it seems challenging. It is challenging because they feel like they're 14 steps away from Jesus. Like, we've got to get you here, to get you here, to get you here, to be like, yes, Jesus, right? Right? That's a challenge. But we realize that we can help the world, that we can guide the world because Christ is our answer. Amen?